Hi, I'm Antigone Darling of Sex, Lies, and Anarchy. If you've heard my podcast, you know that I often say things that get me in trouble. I've been called a misogynist and a feminist within the same conversation. So one morning, I'm going through my routine, coffee, and Facebook, and I read this article about a man who got fired from an elite college for the way he taught history. This article featured a chapter from his book about prostitutes in the West during the mid-19th century. I was intrigued, and his book became the first I read cover to cover in four years. I know he's a great speaker, not only from his talk at Alt Expo last night, but also because we recorded an episode of Sex, Lies, and Anarchy, and we couldn't get a word in edgewise. So, as his students used to call him, here's Bad Thad Russell. I thought, I thought the point of being interviewed was that you wanted to hear from me. Wasn't that the... Uh... So, um, yeah, so I want to talk about uh, freeing half a million political prisoners. Would you like to do that? So we have half a million political prisoners in this country right now, I believe. Do we know who I'm talking about? People who are in prison for doing nothing but pursuing their own pleasure. Nonviolent drug offenders. So I have, I have a plan to liberate them. And it involves a few things. One is hanging out with the Alt Expo people more. <clears throat> it involves libertarians talking not just about freedom, but also about pleasure and about shame. And it involves living without shame. So let me just tell you about my experience this weekend and how it gave me this epiphany. Um, <clears throat> so I arrive at the airport, I arrive here at the hotel on Friday night, and I go up to the second floor and I'm walking, I, as soon as the elevator opens, it's like this giant cloud of marijuana smoke, you know, I was like, wh these people are ridiculous. I mean, they are just pouring marijuana out into the hallway and it's against the rules of the hotel, right? You know? So immediately I said, these are a shameless people, these Alt Expo people. These are a shameless people, right? Clearly, they had no shame about smoking marijuana, right? Well, it is that attitude that will free those political prisoners. So what I want to do is talk about shame, the history of it. I want to talk about a particular kind of freedom, the freedom to pursue one's own pleasure. I want to talk about the enemies of that freedom and those pleasures, and I want to talk about how we can get to a new place where those people now in prison are free. The best way to do that is to look at history, and that's what my book is about. Um, so let's talk about some freedoms. I want to, I got a, I got a, I talked to Alt Expo last night, and I got a sense of who they were, you know, because I, I always like to ask questions of my audience first just to sort of get a sense of the house I'm playing, you know, so let me make sure everything's going to be okay here. So are you guys, um, <clears throat> I mean, like more or less in favor of a woman being able to walk in public without a male chaperone? <laughs> Is that most? Majority, basically. Okay. Basically a majority. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. How about um, uh, 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 legal alcohol? Are we for that? That was kind of a murmur. I don't even know. Are we... <laughs> That's my man. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, um, dancing in public. <laughs> really? Oh, it depends on how well you... Yeah, that's... Yeah, I don't like this man, right? Can someone... Security? We have... Um, how, about, um, how about music that is not uh, European classical music? Should that be allowed? No. <laughs> I was expecting this to be the easiest audience I've ever played. This... Um, <clears throat> Oh, they're just messing with me. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm glad we're getting along so far. I, let me just let you know that uh, you're the pioneers of those freedoms, the people who should be your heroes, your cultural ancestors, people who should be on postage stamps in free New Hampshire. If you have postage stamps, you can have that. I guess not. Um, are the absolute scum of the earth. That's right. Your cultural ancestors, the people who pioneered those freedoms, are prostitutes, criminals, 
drunks, slackers, slaves, and juvenile delinquents. Welcome to your new world. So let's talk about, let's talk about first um, work. Oh, okay, so work is something that libertarians don't talk about nearly enough, except for about 10 of them who are all my friends. Um, work, so school sucks? Work sucks too, doesn't it? Do we all agree on that? I've never been sure, yes, yes, see some, mm -mm, see. Thank you, you can stay. So, that, well, I, okay, I mean, I'm sympathetic with that position. I just don't know if I want to do, go all that way. But, so, I often don't hear that, actually, among libertarians. So here's the problem from my point of view. This is, this is my friendly critique of libertarianism, okay? So, libertarianism, I think you agree, sort of its basic tenets. I know there are a thousand and a half arguments among you people, but, the, you know, the basic tenet is it's, it's, it's based on classical liberalism, right? Classical liberalism, a lot of people don't understand this, although I think libertarians do more than others, is premised on the idea of what was called, or what is called, the self-regulating individual, right? I regulate myself so the state doesn't have to, right? So that meant, from Adam Smith onward, it meant actually severe self-discipline and repression. So all the classical liberal thinkers preached severe self-discipline and repression. From Smith to Locke to the Founding Fathers to Ron Paul, actually. When he talks about issues, like cultural issues, he's quite, quite conservative. He says, yes, I want other people to have the choice to do those things. I would never do them. Because if I did them, that might invite the state to control me, right? It's not a bad argument, but it seems to me it leads us into a place where we all look and dress and act like and I love the guy, Ron Paul. So I don't know if we want to go there, necessarily. I want to put the libertine back in libertarian. So work was at the center of classical liberalism. Not work to get something else, to get a BMW or a flat screen TV. It is work in itself as a virtue. That is at the center of classical liber lib liberalism and it's at the center of modern libertarianism, I think. But I want to correct that, if you can help me. I want to get rid of that. That is the Puritan work ethic. A lot of people get confused about that. They think it is working hard so you can get a big house. No, it is the belief that work in itself is virtuous, godly, and good. Therefore, the Puritan said, no matter what you get for your work, you must love it. You must do it. You must do it all the time no matter what you get from it. If you are rich, you should volunteer. If you make only enough money to remain poor, you should still love your work, right? So that has been at the center of not just classical liberalism, and I think libertarianism to some extent, it has been at the center of American culture since Plymouth Rock. Now, we know, you're gonna say, you're thinking, well, Okay, yes, politicians, right, constantly preach the work ethic. Business leaders constantly preach the work ethic. Teachers constantly preach the work ethic. Anyone with, anyone with authority in our society loves the work ethic, am I right? Statists, it is the lifeblood of statism, right? They really want you to feel bad about not working. What they want you to work on, though, is, of course, the nation state. They want you to sacrifice your freedoms and your pleasure, yourself, your individual liberty for the nation state through work. So that is the problem. If we can somehow build a culture in which that is questioned, why is work a good thing? I mean, I know it says that in the Bible, which is, by the way, where it comes from, the New Testament, right? Does that mean it's true? If we start to question that, we may be living in a world pretty soon in which we're working 35 hours a week and getting paid the same amount. We might end up living in a world where we, we, we work only uh, 30 hours a week and getting paid the same amount. In France, it's happened. Why in France? Because in France, they aren't Puritans. I know the French are very unpopular these days, but they have a point there, right? So that is at the center of the work ethic. 
of the Puritan work ethic. It's the, it's at the center of classical liberalism. Here's, here's an example of how deeply entrenched the work ethic is in American culture. And I'm talking about among workers, right? Among, among ordinary people. So in our hand, we have technology that makes us, what, 10 times more productive? 50 times more productive? A thousand? I don't know, right? It is awesome, the productivity they handed to us that we can hold in our hands. This is the equivalent of a steel factory in Pittsburgh in the 19th century, right here, right, in terms of productivity, maybe more so. Yet we work more hours per week than we did 10 years ago. In Europe, the rates of work have declined. We work hundreds of hours more per year than all the Europeans, all of them. 400 more hours per year than the Danes. Do you, can you think of anything you'd like to do with hundreds of hours of free time away from work? I can. I would like to get there. And by the way, it's not through their statist economies. It's because they don't have the fucking work ethic at the center of their culture. That's the problem. When we are handed technology like this, the next thing we should be doing is saying, oh, now I need to work less. We don't do that. We say, oh, now I can work all the time. <laughs> Most people are not mentally unhinged like that in the world, right? Most people are not Americans. Most people don't think that way. That is why we work far more than almost anyone else on the planet, right? Okay, so shame, shame. How often are people shamed about not working in this country, right? How many times, I'm a big sports fan, I cannot tell, I don't think I've ever watched a game on TV in which the commentator didn't say, he has a tremendous work ethic, Jim. It's always the one white guy on the basketball team, right, who has the work ethic. <laughs> Shame runs throughout this. Antigone was telling me she was at an Occupy uh, demonstration, and someone drove by in a car, I think it was a cop, right? Was it a cop? Or someone. Someone drove by in a car and yelled at her, get a job, right? That is common. To not work in this country is to not be a fully healthy citizen. To not want to work, that's really bad, right? It's the people who love to work, go to work. That's, those are the best American citizens. So the shame is constant. It is directed at you constantly. You are shamed into working, and this is a rule invented by the Puritans, the people with the funny hats the most ridiculous human beings in human history, their ideas are at the center of our culture today, right? Puritanism, which is still with us, has two pillars. One is the work ethic, and the other is what? The anti-sex ethic, that's right, which is paired with another ethic, the nuclear family ethic. So what does that mean? To be a good, godly American citizen, one should never have sex outside of marriage. And the only way to be happy and fulfilled is to be part of a nuclear family for your entire life. That has been the rule of American citizenship since the beginning. Those two things. Shame, again, is brought on people who violate those rules constantly. Have, are people ever shamed about not being a part of a family? when you're a 40-year-old woman and you're not married and don't have children, what do people think about you? They feel sorry for you, right? Even men, even 40-year-old men who aren't married and don't have children, it's such a waste of their life, isn't it? It's so terrible, it's so sad, right? So there are, however, a lot of people in American history who have basically said without saying so, and this is very important, we have no idea what was in their minds because there's no extant record of their thoughts. They never wrote a book or a manifesto. They never went on strike. They never picketed anything. They never wrote a book, nothing, right? There are people who, in their actions alone, said two words to that, fuck you. Let me talk about one group first. The people who invented the weekend. 
Now, if you listen to your typical commie labor historians, they will give credit for the weekend to whom, do you think? Thank you very much. That is a lie. Unions absolutely did ultimately, after a long while, did argue for a shorter work week in the late 19th century only because their members were clamoring for it. And more importantly, if you look at the speeches that were given by union leaders on behalf of a shorter work week, they said, if we continue to overwork our workers, they're not going to want to work anymore. They're going to give up on the Puritan work ethic if you overwork them, right? It wasn't an argument for leisure and pleasure and freedom. It was an argument to keep people believing in the work ethic. They only did it to keep people puritanical. They only did it also because their workers were dying working seven days, six days a week, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day in factories, hell holes, right? That's why. Let me tell you about who actually invented the weekend. The people who invented the weekend were drunk slackers. These were, these were terrible people. Ter I mean, <laughs> these were terrible people. I mean, if they ran this conference, there would be no conference. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Um, <clears throat> So here's what happens when industrial capitalism is invented. Basically the early 19th century in this country, pretty much, right? So where did people, where did the vast, vast majority of people work before factories came here, before capitalism came here? Farms, right. So on a farm, you know, when did you, what, how was your work arranged? What was your work arranged around? The sun, that's right. And the seasons, right? And the, and the roosters, I guess. I don't know, I've never really been on a farm, but that's what I've heard. Um, but we know that, right? We know that. It was based around those things, right? So uh, y all of you, I'm sure, have worked in a capitalist enterprise, and I'm not anti-capitalist. I mean, I am in a way, I'm a free market guy, but I'm not, a, I'm not sympathetic to capitalism and capitalists. But, so in a capitalist enterprise, what structures your work instead of the sun and the roosters and the seasons? Right, so capitalists invented this thing called time, which I'm being reminded of right now. Um, they invented a thing called time. Marxists said, Marxists aren't always wrong, by the way. Marxists said that time, and I think they were right, is a bourgeois invention. Bourgeois, meaning not the upper class, meaning the managerial middle class, the people who took managerial responsibility for society, the people I'm talking about are our arch enemies. People who want to manage society. That is a middle class phenomenon. Time was their invention. The clock was their weapon against your body. Your body does not want to get out of bed every single goddamn day at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> at the same time. Your body most definitely does not want to sit in a cubicle for eight hours every fucking day. Your body would like to leave that place as soon as it can. It does not want to wait for five or six or seven or nine o'clock at night. Your body, the entire time you are sitting in that cubicle, is thinking about other things you'd rather be doing. Am I making this up? No, and I, we don't have to believe ourselves, believe the capitalists who have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in studying the problem of surfing on the web. They are losing millions and millions and millions of man or work hours to that, to a desire to be out of that fucking cubicle. So there are, as I said last night, there are strikes going on in this country, in every workplace, as we speak. What I'm suggesting, one of the things I'm suggesting is, let's be in solidarity with those strikers. When we find out that a worker, a coworker, a colleague, was looking at, God forbid, of course, what they look at mostly is, what do you think? Porn, looking at porn while they're supposed to be working, don't shame them. Consider them to be freedom fighters. 
<laughs> so you, you just demonstrated that you all have a little tiny cotton mather inside of you, right? The world I'm talking about is one in which we don't even laugh at that because there's nothing funny about sex. There's nothing funny about leisure. There's nothing funny about blowing off work to do something any right-minded human being would rather be doing, right? I'm not blaming you. I'm the same way. I laugh at sex jokes, but that's my point. It's very, very deeply ingrained in all of us, even the most liberated among us. Me, I, who have spent now 20 years thinking, writing, st studying, teaching about this thing, I feel bad if I didn't get enough done during a day. At the end of the day, I feel bad about it. I look at it. I'm like, what the? Who cares? I'm like, it's my cotton, it's my little cotton mather. He's like this big. He's like in here. He's got a little hat on and everything. He's preaching to me. Cotton Mather was the most important Puritan minister. <sighs> okay, so let's let's talk about. Okay, so oh right, time. Okay, so we got all these people who lived according to the t to the seasons and the sun and the roosters, right? And all of a sudden, they're taken off the farm out of nature and put in a big box in front of a big table where they are expected to work regularized hours. They are expected to make their bodies literally into machines. The machinification of the human body, right? Okay, now, these people who experienced that for the first time, we are talking about the first workers in industrial capitalism, what might you think their response would have been? Their response was, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. What, I, what do you mean? No, I just, this is just, it's like, it's as if the capitalists were speaking Albanian to them when they were t talking about time, right? So it wasn't like they went on strike. It wasn't like they pr had marches in the street. They didn't write manifestos and pamphlets and books. You know what they did instead? They, they just showed up late. They just showed up late. Most of them. Here's the other thing that they were used to doing on the farm or whenever they worked or whenever they were doing anything in the, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. What did people do all day long in early America? All day long. They drank. They drank all day long. Now, to get a, if you owned a business in this, in this era, uh, in this era, to employ workers, you needed to supply beer and grog to them on the job. Why? Because there was no one to replace them with. There were no teetotaling workers to replace them with. So it was standard that employers had to allow those workers to come in basically when they felt like it and to supply them with beer and grog all day long and give them breaks so that they can drink. Standard. They left also kind of when they felt like it, often when the sun, you know, started to wane or not. They just weren't acculturated to this culture, right? To this puritanical, industrialized culture. The mechanization of the human body was just a foreign concept to them, right? We don't know what they thought about any of this, right? Don't ever make claims about people's thoughts. The left does this constantly, right? Oh, the people of Bangladesh want the following. They don't know shit about the people of Bangladesh, but we do know, we do know about their thoughts, but we do know, and you can make claims about people's behaviors and actions, so we know this, because we have tons of evidence from employers during this period complaining about these slacking drunken workers. Okay, so the workers would drink all day long through the week, then it kind of ramped up toward the weekend, right? Because the weekend was coming, right? But they were supposed to work on the weekend. So by the way, these are six or seven day work weeks we're talking about here, right? <clears throat> so they get to Friday night hammering, Friday night. Saturday is just like basically a party on the job. If they work Sunday, even more so. By Sunday night, they were so wasted, they couldn't really do anything productive the following day. But the thing was, the following day happened to be, oh shit, a Monday. So they come in on Monday, and they don't work then either. <laughs> From Saturday through Monday, employers complained, I can't, you can see this, it's all over the place, I can't get them to work at all. From Saturday to Monday night. Tons of evidence of employers complaining about this. So guess what those workers, those drunken, slacking, scum of the earth created for themselves and 
for themselves, they created the three-day weekend. Three-day weekend, right? For us, they created the space in which we can demand a weekend. They broke through that Puritan idea, that Puritan injunction that one must work all the time simply through their behavior. And we have entered that space and created formally what is now the weekend. Of course, that is now being eroded as well, right? We're working more and more with our goddamn smartphones and our computers that can do anything in the world. We're still doing that because of our cotton mathers inside of us, I believe. OK, so there's the weekend. We've got that covered. OK, on to women. Small topic. Women. Women's freedom. Here's where women's freedom comes from. Women's freedom comes from people who looked somewhat like all the women in here. In the 19th century, don't, just don't get don't upset. No, don't, just try, just, just wait for me to finish the whole, before I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. Everybody calm down. Everybody, okay. So just, I just, I'm just being a historian here. If this were the 19th century, every woman in here would be a whore. Is that, am I still, well, the men, don't say shit like that. The men just, that's like, I don't know these guys. I don't associate with that. I champion whores for not that reason. Uh, I champion whores because they did many, many, many things that you all now take for granted that were restricted at the time, that you could not do and be a respectable woman. You could not come to a conference in public without a male chaperone. Well, you couldn't come to a conference at all, right? If you were a respectable woman, you couldn't be in public. You couldn't go to a bar. You couldn't drink in public. You couldn't smoke in public. You couldn't dance in public. Uh, Oh, okay, so let's get personal. Oral sex, right? Oh my God, well that was like completely the devil's work. Prostitutes did it and advertised it. They did it without shame. Just like those workers in that factory, in those factories in the early America who didn't show up and didn't even think about it. They had no shame about the fucking work ethic. They didn't even know about it. They didn't think about it. These women had no shame about wearing bright colors. That was not okay for respect. That, I mean, really. The symbol of the prostitute in the 19th century was the red dress. It was called the scarlet shame of the streetwalker. The red dress, right? To wear red, you were, you were definitely a whore. Who wears the red dress now? The first lady. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Stop putting words in my mouth. <laughs> Women couldn't wear cosmetics. That was absolutely, the cosmetics industry was basically developed for prostitutes only. It was horrific for a woman to wear makeup unless they were a whore, right? Well, then it was horrific to be a whore, so yeah, it was always horrific. Uh, to color their hair, to earn wages, earn wages that were comparable to, or God forbid, greater than men. Guess who did that first before feminists even raised it as an issue? Prostitutes, why? Because they understood a little something about economics and supply and demand. There was a huge demand for their product and not that much supply, especially in towns like the West, where in many of these towns there were like 5,000 men and 20 women. They could charge basically anything they wanted to. These women got rich really quickly selling a product. Yeah. And then I say this to people, and they're like, but they were selling their bodies. They were selling. How can you, how can you not think that's different than other kinds of work? Well, it's, I want to ask you, how can we? I mean, should we think about that as being fundamentally different than other kinds of work? They absolutely were selling their bodies. Intimately, no question about it. Is that different than other, just fundamentally, qualitatively different than other kinds of work? What am I doing right now, if I were getting paid? <laughs> what is this? Where is it now? It was in Los Angeles two days ago. Now it's here. I had to move this body all the way across country, get up on this stage. What is this? What is my mouth? 
Everyone sells their bodies. Some people sell their bodies very intimately. Football players. You think that's not an intimate use of one's, selling of one's body? Right? It goes on and on and on and on. Every worker sells their body, right? This is quite intimate. You're all staring at me, right? Every time I teach, I do this. Everyone's staring at me, studying me, studying my body. I'm selling my body. So I said to my class last semester, I said, we're all whores in here. It got me into trouble. <laughs> So there was tremendous demand for that and short supply because most American women were too worried about being respectable and would never do something like sell this precious sacred thing, right? This thing that is different than all other things on earth for some reason, sex, right? Some reason, that's just fundamentally, qualitatively different than everything else you do with your body for some reason. Some reason being the Bible. So they did that and they got rich. So brothel owners, madams in the West, right? They got large. Seattle, large portions of Seattle, large portions of the Northwest were owned by brothels in the 19th century. Large chunks of San Francisco were owned by brothel owners. After the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, Jesse Heyman, who was the most famous madam in San Francisco, she clothed, by the way, this should be a libertarian hero, she clothed, housed, and fed thousands of people who had lost their homes. A whore did that with money from ill-gotten gains, right? In Los Angeles, there were black madams, Jewish madams, Cherokee madams, Asian madams who owned most of what is now downtown Los Angeles. It was tremendously democratic and interracial, by the way. Why? Because these were amoral people, right? The morality of the time was don't mix with other races. Because these were amoral people to begin with, they were like, who cares? They're customers, right? So all of these freedoms were pioneered by whores. All of these freedoms that we now take for granted. We take these freedoms like the air right? Wearing colors, going out in public, drinking in a bar. Oh, here's another one you guys will really love. Prostitutes were the very first women, the only women for quite a while, who regularly, routinely, and here's the important thing, without shame, defended themselves with guns, right? Only men were supposed to do that. They were supposed to protect the women. Well, these women were on their own. Right? Brothel owners own these brothels. They had to have security. Right? So they either hired a cop, which is very interesting, but more often they just own guns. And there are many, many stories of madams and prostitutes shooting men who tried to rape them or assault them or steal from them. Right? These should be on the libertarian flag. These women should be on the libertarian flag, the libertarian postage stamp. Your state seal, if you ever have one. No, I don't have a state seal. <clears throat> Here's the important thing, though. Those drunken, slacking workers and these prostitutes had no shame. They had no shame. Like my Alt-Expo comrades, they had no shame about something that the rest of society said was bad. And look what happened with those freedoms. Look what happened with the things they had no shame about. Now we all take them for granted. Now we are all free in those ways because of those people. They didn't say a thing, they just did it, right? So you can march, you can protest, you can petition, you can run for Congress, you can establish a free state, you can do it. I'm saying simply standing on a street corner smoking weed without shame will do more than any of that. And the more people who do that, the more the culture will change. And when the culture changes to the point, changes to the point and we're getting there, we're getting there, the more the culture changes to the point where people think smoking weed is like nothing. It's like eating a sandwich. It's done. Those people are free. They are leaving prison, right? And we no longer have to worry about that. We will all be free in that way. And of course, there are many other freedoms to talk about. That's just one that's quite relevant right now because I believe that will happen in my lifetime. But it has to happen. It's starting 
of course, with people like you. Of course. You're the pioneers. You're the whores. You're the slackers. You're the drunkards. That's right. And don't ever be ashamed of it. And don't ever shame anyone else for pursuing their pleasure. I've, even, I've, heard, I've heard libertarians do it. I've heard libertarians do it. It's unconscious. I don't blame them. Even I do it, right? You hear about someone who's a real stoner and there's like this sneer, right? Just don't do it. Don't shame people for pursuing their own pleasure, right? And we're going to live in a freer world, and that's going to happen in our lifetime, I promise you. Let me tell you about um, one other group, and then I'll, I'd love to take some questions. Um, really, just, God, I mean, terrible people. <clears throat> um, now, seriously, I mean, I, I don't want to be anywhere near these people. Really, I don't think you would either. I'm talking about gangsters. Bad motherfuckers, seriously. Okay, so every, however, every single bottle of alcohol that was consumed in the United States of America during Prohibition passed through the hands of a gangster. They were the front line army for that war for freedom, a real war for freedom. Without them, it would still be illegal. Every bottle, they brought it in on giant sleds from Canada into New Hampshire and Michigan, right? They brought it in on boats, rum runners in the Caribbean, and then they opened speakeasies. The entire chain of distribution and supply was operated basically by gangsters, right? Everyone was illegal. All those people, of course, gangsters, by definition of their work, are what? Shameless. They're shameless. Right? Thank God for Sicilian and Jewish immigrants. That's who we're talking about. Sicilian and Jewish immigrants, and that's important that they were immigrants. They were new immigrants. They had just gotten here from a different country where they had very different cultures. Right? They get here and it's like, America? I see a business opportunity. What's America? Right? Your code of morals? What is that? I came here to make money, dude. Right? So all these respectable businessmen and businessmen who were just afraid of going to prison wouldn't enter that market, right? Because of the state. Well, but these bad people did. The, the shameless people did. The brave, shameless people did. So we have them to thank for legal alcohol. One last thing, and then I'll take some questions. Because they were shameless, they invested in another burgeoning market at the same time. Historians widely agree that the first emergence, identifiable emergence, of a gay subculture was in the 1910s and 1920s, New York City especially, right? This was at the height of industrialization and urbanization, people coming to cities, right? You could be as gay as you wanted to be in the middle of the, war, in the, middle of the country, but you couldn't do anything about it. So if suddenly you had all these people coming to big cities, meeting each other, having sex, and more importantly, establishing a public culture. But it was mostly on the streets right? Because they had no public place to go to. They were barred from those places. It was illegal to be homosexual at the time, right? Well, guess who invested in the very first gay bars in the United States of America? The Genovese and Gambino crime families. The first gay bars were owned by the mafia from the 1930s all the way until 1969. The mafia could do something that other businessmen could not. So it was standard practice from the 1930s through the 1960s at non-mob-owned bars for the cops to do what every single week? Show up in their paddy wagons, march into the bar, take everyone out, put them in the paddy wagon. They're not done then. They take them down to the police station. They take their names. Then they reported their names to the newspaper. Public shaming, see? Shame is the health of the state, not just war. So that's that was... That's what, was, that's what being gay was, except in the mob-owned bars. Why was it safe? Why were mob-owned bars safer, do you think? They paid off the cops. They understood how this worked. One of the, cop, one of the bars, one of the gay bars where the mob paid off the cops for protection from that, from the raids, was a place called the Stonewall Inn in New York City on Christopher Street, right? Now, people may have heard of the Stonewall Inn because of the famous riots that happened there in June of 1969. That night, the cops came 
the New York PD came, a lot of people don't know, most people don't know this, they came not because they were breaking their contract with the mob, but because the feds, the feds forced the New York PD to raid that bar, not because of the gays and the drag queens and the butch dykes inside, but because it was owned by the mafia. And the feds were after the mafia in 1969 in a big way. So they forced the New York PD to raid that bar on June 6, 1969. But that night, that night, the drag queens, the butch dykes, and the faggots picked up rocks and bottles and threw them at the cops. Then they set fire to the police cars. That is not the most important thing about that night, in my view. That night, they marched into the street and were joined by people in the neighborhood. And here is the most important moment in that entire thing, I think. And very few people say that. They chanted, we are faggots and we are not going home. Over and over. We are faggots and we are not going home. Shameless. Shameless faggots. What happened after 1969, after that riot? By the way, that riot went on for two nights. People think it was one night, two nights. People were rioting in front of the Stonewall and across Greenwich Village for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, shouting, we are faggots and we're not going home. Oh, then they broke into a chorus line dance. <laughs> You're right. We're faggots, look at us. Right. Some of us want to be women. Some of us pretend to be women. You're right. That's who we are. And you know what? We're going to make this really public. We're going to do it in the fucking streets of New York City. And when you come and try to contain us and put us in prison, we're going to fuck you up. We're going to throw stuff at you. We're going to burn down your car. And everyone found out about it. And what happened after 1969 in regards to police raids of bars, gay bars? How often are gay bars raided now? When's the last time you heard of a, a, a police raid of a gay bar? Guess what happened? Studies have shown that over just the next two to three years, every single municipality in the United States of America ended the practice of police raids of gay bars. Because of those shameless, and that's the word, faggots. Right? So if anyone ever calls you a whore or a slacker, or a faggot say, thank you very much <laughs> for the compliment. I am, in fact, a freedom fighter by being one. You idiot, misogynist, repressed, imprisoned fucker. <laughs> now I'd love to take questions. Thanks very much. I'm sure, I'm sh unless I've stunned you into silence, but I doubt that. Glenn. Oh, or you. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. He's giving me my ride, so I got to be nice to him. Yeah. Do you think there's an advantage to moving out of the culture you grew up in so that you, like you were saying with the mobsters coming here, they just don't like see what's going on in that culture as being legitimate as far as like being able to have that attitude? Yeah, um, I think I understand your question. So it's about being an outsider in a new place, right? Where you're not part of that culture. Yeah, yeah. So this is why a major theme in my book is assimilation. Assimilation is the devil's work in my view, right? We have all these, and that goes, that goes not just for immigrants, it goes for every group that's been marginalized, right? This is what gay marriage is all about. Gay marriage, I wrote a piece in Reason, for, in Reason about this. Gay marriage is about the assimilation, primarily. That is actually what it was about. That's what it started as. The first people who called for gay marriage among gays said this explicitly. It is time to get out of the bars and the bathhouses. It is time to ha stop having sex in bushes. It is time to stop having promiscuous sex. It is time to dress respectably. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, to get married. It wasn't actually ever about freedom. It was always about imprisoning people in the nuclear ethic, the nuclear family ethic, right? That's what it was, it was a conservative thing. It's a conservative movement. I am daily blown out of my desk chair by progressives proclaiming it as a great movement toward freedom. 
oh, yes, I understand, you can get 1,400 rights, privileges, and benefits from marriage in this country, right? But guess what? In Europe, they solve the problem. It's called civil unions. They don't get married, and they get those 1,400 rights, benefits, and privileges. Marriage is much more than just a legal contract. It is a cultural contract. You have contracted yourself to not have sex with anyone else for the rest of your life. That's why it was invented in the 18th century. It was invented explicitly to keep people from having sex. I kid you not. So assimilation is always a movement toward homogenization. It is always a movement toward the elimination of difference. If you are interested in difference, I mean, unless, if you're not interested in difference, I mean, I guess you could move to Norway. Although, of course, what's happening in Norway now, right? They have immigration, they're freaking out about it, right? I don't want to live in 1950 Norway where everyone looks exactly the same and everyone believes in social democracy and every, you know. So assimilation must be combated if you are in favor of difference and especially freedom. If you want to hear different ideas, see different opinions, and if you want especially a challenge to things like the Puritan work ethic and the nuclear family, invite others, outsiders in and don't make them change, let them make, let them make us change. Yeah, in the back. Or. Oh, you were next, right? Or do you well, go ahead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad about that, Glenn. Uh, two questions. One, what do you think about workplaces that are a lot of fun? You know, I mean, I, 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 I love what you said about the cubicles and stuff. Um, you know, I managed to find it. I have a situation where I work five days a month kind of in a cubicle, but it's really sweet and it's like a good, it's a, it's a good vibe. And what about a lot, of, have you noticed or uh, read about a lot of the West Coast software development shops are now have yep. kegs of beer? Absolutely. They're like bringing yeah. back the drinking on the job thing, which well. I thought was interesting. And I know some of them, uh, some of them are, are, you know, have, uh, are, have done the historical research and have like pictures of the old factories of people drinking. Um, and then my, so yeah, what do you think about a good workplace? What does a good workplace feel like to you? And my second question is, do you have a sense uh, through the history of why sex is so awful? Like, I, it's pretty easy to understand the like commercial interest in making work like you have to work all the time. Like, I see why the, there's a clear benefit to the implanting that that message. But what's up with the sex thing? Like, what what did why, How did anybody ever get you know why why? Yeah. Okay. Small questions. Uh, let me think. <clears throat> Just take a minute or two. Um, why do we hate sex? Why do we hate and love sex? Um, well, okay, I have an answer. Because it is animalistic. Okay, so Western culture is based on what is called the mind-body duality, right? This is from Plato, 400 BC, amplified by the Christians. Our soul, it's just a belief, it's just a theory, our soul is divided into two things. The mind, which is the rational, controlling, good part, and the body, which is the part with the appetites, the desires, the id, that's the bad part, right? So the mind must control the body. That's what civilization is built upon, right? Um, all you got to do is read The Republic by Plato and the New Testament, and you will see what I'm talking about. This is the whole point of those books, is that. So, well, what goes with the body? Sexuality. Things that are animalistic, childish, right? Irrational. Sex is totally irrational, right? You can't, you can't build a bridge making sex. Having sex. You could try. Now, that's some multitasking, but I don't think... Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's, is that's, it goes to the root of the foundation of our culture that we're living in. It goes, I mean, every, everybody agrees that the foundations of our culture basically are in Christianity and er, the early Greeks, right? So that's it. Um, we have this mind-body duality, which, by the way, is based on what scientific evidence, that our, that our soul is divided into two and that there's a hierarchy, that one is better than the other. I'll tell you what it was. Socrates had this amazing microscope. It was super powerful. He took a cell, human tissue, put it under the microscope, looked at it, and he saw, he saw B on one of the cells for body, and he saw M for mind. No, he fucking made it up. It's a theory, right? <laughs> which our entire civilization is founded upon. <laughs> so that's where all the repression comes from. Read those dudes in the robes. They spell it out for you. But we've just followed all the way. The Enlightenment also amplified it again, right? The Enlightenment, yeah, they got away with, did away, did away with God, which was good, but they made rationality, the rational mind, the new God. And then, oh, guess you guys know this. And then after that, in the 18th and 19th centuries, basically the same people, 
made another thing the new god, the state, the nation state. That became the new god, right? So progressivism is simply secular Christianity. There's no question about it. It's the exact same moral structure, the exact same moral structure. The people who made the nation state, who killed hundreds of millions of people, they are exactly Christians with a sec with a secular with, with without God, right? Um, oh, I am sure that Google does not allow drinking while people are working. They must. I'm sure they they have like a, a groovy bar with like sandbag chair, sand beanbag chairs, and like a disco ball after. But it's for after work, man. Google is not going to let people work while they're programming. No, I mean, not, not, not let them drink while they're programming. The insurgency of, of, of software development shops that, are, that do that. that, that like, okay. It's specifically hard to that. Well, no one drinks and they code at the same time. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. <laughs> so, but, you're, you, I mean, but you, had a much, you had a more important question, which was about the... Yeah, no, what, what do, you, do you have anything oh. to say about a good... Like, that, can, can we look back through history at, at places where there were really good workplace vibes and kind of like, what does that look like in contrast to the shitty workplace? Of course there are better and better workplaces than others, but guess what? No matter how good your workplace is, it can always be better, right? No matter how much freedom you have, you can always get more. No matter how much pleasure you have in your life, you can always get more. So that's what I say, but let it be a perpetual opposition. We should be perpetually oppositional to the boss and to the state. No matter who it is, no matter where it is, no matter how nice they are, always be in opposition to them because they have fundamentally different interests than we do, if you're a worker. They have fundamentally different interests, conflicting, contradictory interests. Always be in opposition to them and always be skeptical of them. You know, the way that the left has been so skeptical of Obama, you know, the way they've just been not, you know, believed anything he said about killing people and, you know, civil liberty, you know, the way that, you know what I'm talking, no. Yes, right here. I, I work for a company called F5 in Seattle. Uh -huh. I can tell you that we drink all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm wrong, I have to go. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, throughout the day, you know, lunch and so forth, we do have beer Friday. Um, when you go out to lunch and you're having beers and you look over at the table next to you and the director and the VP you know, of your department right. are also sitting there having beer. Okay, well, sure. So Google, I mean, right. So this may be just part of the whole movement this guy was talking about in Silicon Valley, which is to make workplaces extremely fun places to be, right? I know everybody's heard about this. Like Google is just like one big playroom with a bunch of computers in it, right? Sleep pods. And well, there you go. And sleep pods. <laughs> so what do you think they were trying to accomplish in making the workplace so groovy and fun? They were just, they're just nice guys. They're just totally nice guys. We're like totally chill and want to have a good time, dude. What? No, they want to make your life work and your work life. But, but also, we, we don't have sleep pods. My boss is like, go home. He's like, screw it. Okay. Like, go home. Yeah, okay. It's a normal thing. I'm not saying that. Yeah. Like, okay. Pe well, so I mean, but the ideal thing, of course, here's the thing. Here's, here's, the th here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your identity as yourself, your self-identity, and what you do with it. Do you give it, do you merge it with something or someone else? That's the choice, right? And this is what I love about libertarians. I love this about libertarians. When they talk about the United States, unlike everyone else, they never say we. They never say us. We bombed those children, no. They did it, right? So what I'm talking about is never merging your identity. You guys, this is easy for you guys. Never merge it with a nation state. Never work, merge it with your company, right? But walk into Google or Zappos. You know about Zappos? Like the guy basically bought all of Las Vegas and made it into this one big playroom with you know workers in it. They, and, and I don't think, I don't believe in false consciousness. I think that's a totally paternalistic Marxist idea. I think they really, they do re seem to really like it. I mean, they really, really do. I don't, I don't think they're wrong. I don't think they're bad for liking it. But it's just that that's not where I want to live. I don't want to live at work, thank you very much. If you do, fine, great. I like the shoes that you deliver to my house. But that's just not the world I want to live in. Yeah, so follow up. I just have one more thing. Um, the, the first
first notion that I got about what you're talking about, and when I was reading your book, I, I was... Oh, you read my book? I, oh, I, 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 now I like you. Okay. A little bit. <laughs> um, uh, Ian, it's blowing my mind. But every chapter after chapter. But uh, the first notion that I got of this is I was uh, exchanged with a, a French student, went, went over to France and was living with uh, their family for a little while. And I, people would ask, what, what do you do? And, uh, mm -hmm. and my, you know, my first response was, oh, yeah, I, I, I work at a movie theater. <laughs> and they're like, no, what do you do? Wow. What do you like to do? Wow. What, what do you do with your time that you choose to do? Right. And it, that blew my mind. There you go. And I, That's I it. still catch myself doing it. You know, I still catch myself doing that and asking people the same thing. But every now and then when I do catch myself, I'm like, no. I'm, I'm not asking you what you do for a living, what you make money for, what you hoard yourself for. Right. I'm asking what you do with your time that you have. Right. So, right, so that is the French and generally European attitude toward work. Now, you know, of course, what happened to them with that attitude. They live in poverty. They don't, oh, and they don't produce anything, right? Because they don't believe in work is a good thing. They live, they live in mud huts, last time I checked, the French. Yeah, oh, oh, and the Swedes and the, Nor and the Norwegians and the Danes. My God, it's like, it's like. It's like Mozambique there. I mean, they don't, they don't produce anything because they don't believe in work as a virtue, right? Well, Scandinavians believe in work as a virtue. Not like this. Not like this. They're probably number two, though. They work hundreds of hours less per year than we do. Hundreds of hours less per year. The Puritan work ethic did not sink nearly as deeply there. Okay, here's why they actually live just as well as we do and work hundreds of hours less. When they get technology, they say, oh, this is a labor-saving device. When we get technology, we say, this is a labor-increasing device. Now I can be working on the airplane, in the taxi cab, when I'm walking down the street, right? So when in the 1980s, uh, the Great Britain had a postal strike. Postal service went on strike. Guess what emerged out of that? The invention of the fax machine. Capital, when you withdraw labor from capital, must replace that labor with something. What has capital been doing for more than 100 years when, when labor has been withdrawn for various reasons? They've replaced it through innovation, technology, right? That's what we can do. But again, if we did this, if this was a workplace and we just did it right here, right? You guys all said, I was the boss and you guys were like, fuck this, we got technology, we're not gonna work anymore. We're gonna we're work less. I would immediately fire you and replace you five minutes later with all the people in the world outside here who don't have those ideas in their head. So it's a cultural change. So always question this thing that's at the center of our, of our society and always has been. The French get it. I like their food. I mean, I think they have something to say it to us, you know? But they're bankrupt. But they're bankrupt. Well, not because of that. Not because of that. <laughs> and we're, yeah, thank you. That's right. Okay, um, in the back, in the back. Speakeasies, right. and then, of course, open brothels, and they probably worked really hard to make those things happen. Sure, yeah. So, what were, what were brothel owners? Small business owners. What were the gangsters? Small business owners, right? The people who invented jazz and rock and roll, which, by the way, you understand, I hope maybe you don't know this, jazz and rock and roll were widely considered, widely, almost universally considered, to represent the end of American civilization when they began widely. John F. Kennedy, that wonderful freedom-loving liberal, and Barry Goldwater co-chaired a congressional committee to investigate the dangers that rock and roll posed to American society in 1957. And they concluded, they concluded, they concluded that in fact, yes, yes, it was. It would bring down American society, right? Um, the people who First, oh, by the way, who owned the very first jazz clubs in the United States of America in New Orleans when Louis Armstrong was 15 years old? Who invested in the very first jazz clubs? Who, were the, who was the first person to pay Louis Armstrong to play his music? Sicilian mafiosi. Same reason. It was jungle music. It was primitive. 
It was uncivilized. It was nigger music, right? Mafia, the Sicilians were like, I don't even know what those words mean. I see a buck. I see a buck. I don't care if it's a nigger, whatever that means. I'm going to pay him for it because he brings in customers, right? Small business owners. Small business owners who changed the world just by doing that. So work doesn't just mean work being a lot of hours. It means working not voluntarily for somebody else. Like if you're a small business owner and you're working 100 hours a week and you love it. Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, yeah. So I love entrepreneurs. I am one. I mean, I love them. I love, of course, what they've done. It's get out of their fucking way and let them do what they want to do, right? And my God, what a world we'll live in. Um, but the downside is, yes, it's a lot of work. I mean, they tend to work more than work non-sovereign um, business, uh, non-sovereign workers, workers who work for someone else. They tend to work a lot more. It's simply that even if the state were completely out of their hair, it's just a lot of work. Um, but that's all I have to say to them is God bless you for doing that, right? I mean, thank you for inventing my iPhone, <laughs> among a thousand other things. Yeah. Um, when you say that the difference is working for another man's dream versus your dream in terms of working with people at Google, you're not working for their dream or whatever. You're working to help the owner of Google achieve his dream. Is that the difference between like, the problem of work and the not working for your own purpose? Yeah, so the, the, the workers who, so that's, that's a case of identifying with the company, right? That's their business. I mean, I'm not saying they're bad or evil. I'm just saying you can then do anything you want to those workers, right? Oh, Jesus Christ, we have to cut wages. I'm sorry, we checked the books. If your dream, if your identity is bound up with the success of Google primarily, okay, I'm sorry. I'll now move to a smaller apartment. I'm, you know, I'm just pointing it out. I'm not saying anyone's stupid, evil, wrong. I'm just saying, I just want to point out the cost benefit thing here, right? To people, people aren't aware of that. That's the consequence of it. Nation state, merge, merge your identity with the nation state. What will happen to you? Think of those who have fully, most fully merged their identities with the nation state. Where are they now? In graves. Right? That's what a great soldier is. Those are the greatest soldiers, the ones who have most merged their identities with the nation state. Right. Uh, you've been, yeah, right here in the middle, yeah. You started off talking about uh, 400,000 political prisoners. 500, last, last I heard. Okay, uh, for drug violations. Yeah. Is it directly extensible to all victimless crimes? Oh, well, you mean my argument? Yeah. Oh, of course. Absolutely. No, I'm down with that. Don't, we are all friends on that one. I mean, my God, it's sickening. Oh, yeah, sure, everything. And again, it's all based on shame. It's all based on shame. When there's no shame, laws dissolve. This is another critique I have of libertarians. They're too obsessed with law and the state. I hate the state more than any, as much as anyone, but they're too obsessed with that. Laws don't enforce themselves. Laws don't hold themselves up. The state does not hold itself up. Right? New York City, are you aware? Has anyone been to New York City? Who's been to New York City? Most people. You are aware that jaywalking is illegal in New York City. So is stopping while you're walking on the sidewalk. So is stopping while walking on the sidewalk. Oh, you walk on the sidewalk? Right. You stop on right. the sidewalk and you get arrested. Right. She got arrested and then when she left and I picked her up at the police station and she stopped to give me a hug to talk to me. Well, okay. My. <laughs> My, my point was, however, that how, how, enforced, how enforced is that law? Not at all, right? Little old ladies and children jaywalk in New York City. Everyone jaywalks, right? Because the culture doesn't believe in it, right? That law. In Washington, D.C., no one jaywalks. I was walking across, I jaywalked in Washington, D.C., and I turned behind, I realized I was the only one in the middle of the street. I turned behind me, I see this homeless guy with a shopping cart, like waiting for the light. I was like, Jesus Christ, these people... <laughs> Right? Culture upholds that law there. It's all about the, change the culture. The laws are irrelevant. The laws are irrelevant. Laws rest on culture. Make, it's a culture war. They're right about that. We have to win it, yeah. So I've got a question about shaming people. You say they're libertarians <laughs> shaming people about their work ethic. And I guess my question is about people with unrealistic expectations. And, um, you know, I don't ever really want to shame somebody for following their passion, but some people, 
tend to follow their passion when it's just they don't know what they're doing, they're not getting there, they're not making any progress, and then they end up mooching off of their friends and becoming oh. sort of a drain on everyone. And sure. you get to the point where you're like, Jesus, just get a fucking top, you know, like sure. do something. And, and you know, what do you, how do you deal with that? Don't, so don't use shame, don't give them anything. Really, right? Right. Replace replace the politics of moralism with the politics of self interest. <laughs> self interest that applies to everything, right? So don't shame them. Just say no. I'm not going to give you ten bucks or whatever. You're right. It's pretty simple. It's quite a libertarian idea, by the way. Yeah. Should we should not have had to go over this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He sure Nick. shamed you. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Oh, no. Damn it. I never said I was perfect. Just better. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Nick. <laughs> Nick. Um, so what do you think about uh, distinguishing between different types of work? So I was reading uh, this essay uh, as part of a larger book by uh, this, uh, I believe he's a Marxist, uh, Andre uh, Gores, and he has this chapter in his book called The Crisis of Work, and he talks about these three different types of work. So he talks about work, uh, this is what mostly uh, the current uh, structure in society is based on, it's working for economic ends, it's working for a wage, you're not working because you're interested in the job, you like the job, you like the boss, you like the co-workers, you care about what Google wants to do with the world. Uh, that's what most of the world is. Uh, so that's one type of work. Another type of work you talked about was working for yourself, so like basic necessities like getting food, uh, uh, child rearing, stuff like that. And then the third type of work uh, was autonomous activity, so it's like work that you want to do, uh, there's no compulsion involved, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just curious what you think about, in, in terms of being, I guess, more clear, um, with how we can how we can oppose work as a concept because I think I think the, the, I think a more uh, I think a good way to think about work is in opposing it at least as a current stance and advocating autonomous activity as opposed to working for a wage or working for a boss. Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, is this similar to uh, um, employee self ownership? Uh, autonomous activity. Well, yeah. So. I, Here's what I'm thinking of. Maybe this is wrong. But here's, an ex here's what I immediately think of when, when you say that. So you know Naomi Klein, right? No logo and right. So she did this. She did this. Um, she did this documentary film called The Take. I don't know if anyone's seen, seen it. Factory workers in Argentina who took over the factory when the when the boss left. I guess he ran, the boss went bankrupt. I think and left. And so the factory, the workers took over the factory and started operating it themselves. Of course, to Naomi Klein and the left, uh, that's a wonderful thing, right? Wow, that's great. That's like worker ownership. They get to do whatever they want there. I mean, that's control. They get well. So, in the course of the interviews of the workers, she says, "So, so what's your what's your day like now?" You know, and the guy was like, "Well, so I um so we work uh, same work that we did before. You know, same shift, seven eight hours, and then um, and then we have meetings." We have meetings after work to, uh, you know, to manage the factory, right? So, and those meetings, oh, how often, how long do those meetings last? Oh, you know, well, it's a lot of, I mean, managing is a lot of work. So we, we're often up until, you know, midnight, two in the morning, you know, talking about how to run the factory. And I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. You know, we, we work so much more now. It's so great to own this fa <laughs> So that's, that's why I, be that's why I left social. I used to be a socialist. That now, that's why I became an anti-socialist. I know I get all the arguments about it's inefficient, no incentive, blah, 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 all good arguments. My argument against it is that it's too much fucking work. <laughs> you got to work all day, right? Because right? we're all workers, right? Everybody's a worker now. Work all day. Then you got to manage the factory you're working in, meetings. Then you got to, doesn't stop there. It's just starting. Then you got to manage the town. Then you got to manage the state. Then you got to manage the country you're living in. Then you got to manage the world. I mean, I don't know when we're going to do anything for fun. That's why I have argued socialists are very puritanical. If you look at the history of socialist cultural thought, fiercely puritanical. And that is why, not because they're necessarily bad people, but because their ideology requires it, right? 
So that's my problem, I think, with your position. But go ahead, come back to me. But, but uh, I, think, I think more what, I, what, what Boris is talking about, what I, what, I would, what I would suggest is that ideally, uh, I would like work, at least as it currently stands, uh, as working for economic ends and not working for yourself uh, to be uh, abolished. And then I would like the choice, at least in a, in, a, in a truly free society, to have people have that option to not be able to work, or at least not be able to work in, in the sense that, like, yeah, you are, um, you know, part of a, a cooperative or collective. I do like I do like cooperatives and collectives. I do agree that uh, there's a tendency within uh, socialists, even even less institutional like uh, socialists, uh, to uh, to want too much planning, to want too much managing, uh, and they don't uh, kind of like just. Uh, if you notice the IWW, for example, that a lot that a lot of the people, uh, the industrial workers in the world, uh, that they have a lot of sort of minor bureaucracy in the meetings and that there's a lot of people who have been around for a while and really like to work. Okay, so this is why this confuses people sometimes. I don't want to get rid of the bosses. I want them to do all that shitty work that I don't want to do. Some people want to be managers. They want to manage society, right? Some people want to do that. I'm actually glad they're around because I don't really want to, you know, put people in prison and, and tell people to kill people and, you know, deal with the garbage being picked. I'm glad they do that for me, right? Same with the bosses. I don't want to, like, set up the, you know, electricity and pay the rent and all that shit. Like, let them do it, right? Let there be a boss, but always, always demand more. Be perpetually oppositional. Get more and more and more and more from them. Let them do that work while you are gaining more and more freedom. So that's... There's no end to this. I'm not a revolutionary. A revolution is a very bad idea. That means things stop, right? There's always more freedom to get. There's always more pleasure to gain. There's always more days to take off. So this is, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna own something, a worker collective, worker co cooperative, you own it. You're now, you have to be managers. That's, it's just this structural problem with that position, I think, right? It's a structural problem. Now you've got to be self-disciplining. You're gonna be just like those workers in Argentina. Right? And maybe you like that, and that's fine. If you like that, that's great. I just don't want to do that. Thank you very much. I'd like to leave the factory every once in a while. That's all. Are we cool? We'll talk later. OK. <laughs> One more question, and then I'm sure you guys need to go somewhere more interesting. Anything? Yep. And sure. In your book, you talked about um, uh, the area during the freeing of the slaves and about how they Uh-oh. <laughs> I, I thought you were instructed not to raise that in here. Oh, so. Didn't they hand out the pamphlet? No slavery talk in here. Okay. Well, no, the, the question I wanted to ask was really more along the lines of what we were talking about. You were talking about where they were trying to be instilled with this, the same work ethic uh, of this like free man working the land kind right. of idea, right? Right. So my question for you is like, you, it was presented in your book as a, a bad thing, this free man working the land, like just the slave to his like plot of land, like working so many hours. So my question would be like, there, there's people here maybe doing homesteading projects and stuff like that. Like, where, where does a, do you have a place in your mind where you draw the line between someone pursuing what they what they think is like. Um, you know, their passion in life versus just like chasing down a ghost in their head because of this, you know, some kind of... No, I mean, I think, I think many, I, I've known homesteaders. I've read, I've studied them. They're in the, actually, the last chapter of my book, Homesteaders. Um, you know, and I found that they work like dogs because they have to. I mean, it's like I told my students, right? There was this brilliant invention in, in the United States. It was like giving people land. <laughs> if you want to like discipline the hell out of someone, say this. See that plot of land right there? That's yours. You own it. Goodbye. Now they have to raise, literally, they're living out of this land, right? The trees. Imagine the trees, right, in New Hampshire or anywhere, right, back then. Just cutting, just getting the trees out of there is backbreaking work. Then growing stuff out of it, you know? I mean, so it's, it's exhausting. And now I truly believe, see, I don't know about this. There's no such thing as a, I don't believe there's a false dream. I absolutely know and believe there are many homesteaders who say, yeah, that's what I want to do. It's great. But not just that, just any pursuit that like, you know, any entrepreneurial pursuit that's like taking people's focus. Like, do you, so you, you don't, 
I guess you're not putting a value judgment on any particular goal. No. No, I'm not moralizing. I'm trying not to moralize. I mean, what I'm always trying to do is not moralize. Politics of self-interest. Say to me, to the homesteader, go for it, your business, I will not get in your way, don't expect me to do it. Right? That's it. Yeah, right. I'm just realizing that I sort of have a question about how you define worker. I guess I'm taking more questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Okay. If that's cool with you guys, great with me. Okay. How do you define you take Oh, yeah? Like, all day? Okay, cool. <laughs> <clears throat> Unpaid. I think I need to talk to Chris real quick. I'll be right back. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. But how do you define a worker? Like, is everybody a worker, or is some like, is there a difference between the workers and who you're calling like the managers, or are those? Because to me, those are still workers. Yeah. So I. So Marx was not all wrong. So I like I like Marx's definition of working class. Working class, a worker is someone who must work in order to live. It's very simple. Who must work in order to live. That's it. Um, so there you are. And that's who I, I call myself a leftist, I think. And I think for me, the definition of leftist is one who aligns herself with the working class, with the subaltern, those out of power, those who do not have power. I think if you simply, if you align yourself with that side, to me, that, that's what makes you a leftist. Now, that, that includes a bunch of libertarians. Not, not enough, in my view, but a bunch of them, certainly ones who are here. That's all. And then we can argue about strategy. Everything else is just an argument about strategy, right? How to get more money, how to get less work, how to get freedom, all those things. But if you align yourself there, instead of worshiping capitalists like Ayn Rand does, right, that's, to me, the difference between left and right, for me. That's just for me. It's not like a universal Webster's Dictionary definition. Yeah. So your view of unions, is it black or white, or is it gray, or is it good or is it bad? Yeah, so I started out as a labor historian until they kicked me out of the profession. Because uh, I made an argument in my first book that uh, markets for unions, among unions, competition among unions is great for the working class, right? Just like, in, just like in capitalism, right? We want competition among businesses. It's great for whom? The consumers, right? The more competition, the better. So I said, and I found all this evidence that this was the case. The more competition union leaders faced, the more militant they were, the more good stuff they got for their members, the better wages, the lower hours, all that stuff, right? So labor historians were like, First of all, you're not allowed to say that. Second of all, you have to leave now. <laughs> really? Uh, and so why? Why do you think that is? Because labor history is dominated by socialists, right? Socialists want James, we can, I talked to James Tuttle last night about this, so I'm, they want, I'm going to use this, but it, it is complicated. They want one big union. They want one big, of course, right? Why do they want one big union? So that it can take over the state, right? They want unification. They want everyone to have the same interests, the same everything, right? So, good God, you know, unions fighting each other? Oh, no, we can't have that. And I said, well, so who's, so then what are you interested in, comrade? Are you interested in, are you interested in one unified globe? Apparently you are. Or are you interested in what the workers want? Higher wages, fewer hours, better conditions, and in America, almost entirely, period. That's it, right? No, they don't want to manage the goddamn factory. No, they don't want social democracy. No, they don't want socialism. Overwhelmingly, American workers for hundreds of years have wanted just those three things, and that's the end of the story. Give that to me, and I will vote you in as my union leader, right? Commie labor historians refuse to accept that. So all they do is talk about the left-led unions. Go to, a, go to a labor history bookshelf in a library, research library. Seriously, sit down and tell me how many books you can find that are not about a socialist-led union. It'll take you a long time until you get to my book, <laughs> right, about the Teamsters. Not that I love Jimmy Hoffa, but that's what he was. He faced a lot of competition. That's why he was militant. So am I for unions? Yes. Um, but I'm never for union leaders. Same, I have the same position on rank-and-file members and leaders as I do with citizens and state leaders, workers and employers. 
be perpetually, op- if you're in a union, be perpetually oppositional. To- I, I'm not for leaving the union necessarily unless it's just not giving you what you want. Be a consumer, right? If the union actually gives you what you want, higher wages, lower up, great. But never trust the leadership because, again, their interests are fundamentally different than yours. Their interest is power. Their interest is in maintaining their position in that union. So libertarians are absolutely right that union leaders are corrupt pieces of shit and should be opposed constantly. But the prob- I think the mistake libertarians often make is they conflate union leaders with the union rank and file. They are very, not very, they are fundamentally different people with fundamentally different interests, actually. They are. Union leaders will cut a deal with the state if they're a public union, right? They will cut a deal with the state in a second, screwing the workers if it maintains their position or increases their power. They will do that in a heartbeat, right? Same with private sector unions. They'll, they'll cut a deal with the boss in a second if it, if it improves their position and their power. Um, yeah. Over. Well, as a follow-up to that, so here in New Hampshire, one of the issues we've had come up the last couple years is right to work. Right. So from your perspective, if you're saying that unions need to be challenged from inside and right to work allows them to say, you're not meeting my needs, I'm not paying you, so that if my position has been that basically right to work is good for the average union worker because it gives them back the power to say, unless you are doing something for me, I don't want to be part of this union. Um, so what's your position on right to work in that context? Yeah, last time I checked, right to work is a law enforced by the state. Okay, so I have never understood why libertarians have taken that position. I mean, not all do, but why, why do you want the state to regulate intensely that institution but none other? Why is that? Why should the state be intimately involved regulating that one institution in civil society, but you don't want them regulating anything else. I don't get it. Well, it's a response to the federal law. I mean, that's what it is. It's state. It's, it's basically trying to override. So it's an, an act of nullification. Well, it's, it, exactly. It's an act of nullification. It's because right now, collective bargaining is once there's a union, you can't work without that. This says no. Individuals have more rights than that. Well, so but I mean, are we fans of? Laws passed by states? I mean, I'm not. I mean, when California passes a law, I don't like cheer just because it's California, not the feds. I mean, so I, you know, to me, here's, here's what I think. I think people cannot be liberated by others. <laughs> they must only liberate themselves, right? I mean, imagine if someone had come, some, someone had come to the American colonists Someone had come to the American colonists in 1775 from, you know, Brazil and said, you guys are so enslaved, I'm, you need to be liberated and I'm here to, I'm going to liberate you for you because you're too weak to do it yourselves. You're too powerless to do it yourselves. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my army in from Brazil and we're going to liberate you for yourselves because you can't do it. That is fundamentally, that is progressivism 101. That is in the soul of every progressive. They believe that people cannot liberate themselves, right? So I don't like it at all when libertarians start sounding that way. The working class of New Hampshire, if they want to liberate themselves from oppressive union bosses who steal their dues money to pay democratic politicians, they need to do it themselves. And they can, and they will, and they often do. Glenn. Will there always be an oligarch? Um, does it just take different forms, or is it in a constant? I don't mind an oligarchy. I don't mind. Again, you know, if they want to do that work. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Let them do it. You know, I know what I want, and I know I want to, what I want to get from them, and I'm never going to stop fighting them for that stuff. And they're never going to stop fighting me. They shouldn't. It's in their interest. It's in my interest. That's the politics. Natural, yeah. That's the natural equilibrium between in human societies that some people want to run and some people. Don't. Yeah. Let them do the shit work of managing. Great. Have at it brothers. I don't want to do it. Some of you do. Some people do. I don't. That's it. It ain't, it ain't wrong or right. It's just, that's me. And it's, however, the nice thing about my position is I believe I am like the vast majority of people. <laughs> I think the vast majority of people are not interested in managing society or even a small institution, right? I'm with the people on this one, generally speaking, I believe. So, you know, I feel fairly comfortable in my position. Um, so yeah, let them do it. Let the, let the, let the status have it. Fight them every step of the way, but let them have it. Uh, yeah, fly us and you should fly books now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Um, 
All right, thanks very much. This was really, really fun. Awesome, thanks.